um, as outlined in the MGA one, section 197.2 and FOIP legislation 25.1b. Okay, thank you. Could I please have someone make a motion to adopt the agenda as amended? That's so moved, Mayor Barkley. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harrison. All in favor? Thank you. So first up, we will welcome Rudy Friesen from the Red Deer River Municipal Users Group. And um, there's a, a button on that pad there, Rudy, that you bring up your presentation and microphone. So welcome. Thank you for coming today. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, join here with you and share a little bit of information about the Red Deer River Users Group and uh, our most recent uh, presentation that uh, got some attention and, and deservedly so. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. I was uh, uh, talking with Your Worship uh, uh, just prior to the call to order and, and sharing that um, um, this is a, I'm also the Chief Administrative Officer for the Village of Cremona and uh, and so uh, we're involved in, in releasing in water from the watershed as well. So uh, I think water becomes a m more important issue as we move along and, and we see the demands for water and, and less available to share. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the users group uh, as, as a form of some background and, uh, and then share with you some tidbits from presentations we received uh, at our most recent meeting. And uh, at that, after I'm done that, I'll try to answer some questions as best I can. I will say I'm not a water expert by any means, and, and those that are say that it is impossible to be one. So um, with that, I'll, I'll do my best to answer your questions, and, and, uh, and we'll move on from there. Uh, just to give you a sense of the water, and we talked a little bit about this before we got started, um, uh, the Red Deer River has come under some fairly significant interest because all of the water licenses for the Southern Alberta watersheds, um, the elbow, the, the old man and the bow are used up. There are no more licenses available. So you may, re may have recalled uh, in the early 2000s when attention turned to the Red Deer River as they were looking for water for the uh, Cross Iron Mills Mall in Balzac and uh, failing getting water out of Calgary, they thought they'd just uh, trench it from the Red Deer River. Uh, that uh, sense of urgency created the formation of the Red Deer River Municipal Users Group, a group of municipal users only, uh, I'll talk about that in a second, uh, that are worth looking out for the best interests of the Red Deer River because we are the only watershed that has licensing available remaining in, in the province. Uh, so attention to, uh, to the Red Deer River continues to grow. Um, uh, I will say that uh, we're unique uh, as a spokes group uh, I think we would consider that the uh, Red Deer River Watershed Alliance would be the more formal advocate of the Red Deer Watershed. And uh, I will say that they're a more diverse group than we are. Uh, the Watershed Alliance is made up of anyone really that's interested in the watershed. You've got municipalities that are members, you've got businesses that use water out of their companies and corporations uh, that are members, and there's individuals and environmental groups as well. So they're a fairly diverse group that re represents a really nice cross-section when they speak to government. Red Deer River Municipal Users Group, if you're not a municipality and you're not a user of water, you're not a member of the group. Otherwise, you're welcome to participate in the users group. So um, uh, be because we, uh, we have a, an informal interest, we work together with a lot of water agencies. Uh, the Watershed Alliance we work closely with. Uh, Alberta Water Spart Alberta Environment. Um, I'll talk in a little bit about a couple of presentations that we had at our recent meeting from Alberta Environment. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, the next step in this conversation is taking place at presentations this week at our meeting in Drumheller, and it's about drought, drought management, drought mitigation. And we've got two presentations, one more about urban water usage and, and the other about rural. So currently, uh, the Municipal Users Group is uh, uh, about 35 members. Sorry, Kara, I'm behind already. See, you should have let. You just should have kept the clicker. Um, uh, I just keep on talking, and uh, we get to get ourselves in trouble time-wise here. Uh, so we're about 35 members, and and uh, like I said, users uh, from the headwaters. Uh, Sundry would probably be the westernmost member, uh, all the way to the MD of Acadia, which is right on the Alberta-Saskatchewan border. So um, that membership pretty simply works in the best interest of the river and we try to advocate as best we can on behalf of all of its users and uh, there's a, a long-term vision to try to accommodate growth and expansion of not only urban communities but uh, commercial adventures and agricultural ventures within the sustainable capacity of the Red Deer watershed. 
So um, uh, to that end, this group is formed. As I said, I'm a part-time employee uh, of the uh, RDR MUG, and uh, that is funded for uh, through the support of members such as yourselves that pay your 25 cents per capita. It's my understanding, although I only started with the group uh, in the fall, that uh, that 25 cents has not changed since inception of the of the users group. So. Um, uh, uh, and, and I guess to, to uh, finally talk about the key interest in water, I don't think any of it is, is surprising. I talked about the growing demand uh, in the watershed and the decreasing volumes I think that we see from time to time. Um, uh, I certainly see it where I'm from in some of the smaller tributaries like the little red deer and the dog pound. They just don't flow like they used to. Uh, and, and so we've got water obligations to our neighboring provinces to the east. Uh, but we can only share what flows. And so I think as urban uh, users and uh, most specifically urban users, we've done a good job of that. Um, uh, I was just saying earlier that actually the city of Red Deer, because I think this community shares its uh, sewage with Red Deer to be treated. I know Olds does the same. So actually um, uh, in recent measurements, I think it was from uh, 2020, uh, the Red Deer, the city of Red Deer actually put more water back into the Red Deer than they took out. So that speaks to the efficiencies that we're, that we're um, developing as water users, uh, especially in the municipal level. Uh, of course, on the agricultural uh, perspective, if they take it out of there to irrigate, uh, it is more slowly returning to the watershed. So um, we work to try and maintain that growth, but most importantly, that sustainability. And I mentioned uh, the early inception of um, uh, Red Deer River with the uh, Cross Iron Mills development. Uh, there's another one that our group has been talking about recently. There's a fairly significant uh, agricultural irrigation project that's under examination on the very uh, eastern edge of our province at the MD of Acadia. And uh, I, I guess there's a philosophy that uh, uh, if we have to release 50% of the flow of the river to Saskatchewan, we may as well use all we can before we let it cross the border. Uh, that's an admirable philosophy, uh, but we have to make sure that that demand is there. And it's very important from a user standpoint because that's not how river licensing works. Um, uh, you can't be the, the last one gets to take everything that they want. Uh, the usage of the water is dependent on when we got the license. So that would be considered a junior license. So priorities upstream would be given to those users that have had their licenses earlier. So th that kind of leads us to, um, uh, I've pulled a couple of slides uh, from our presentation and, and I shared it with our members and it generated some interest from your group. And these presentations were made by a couple of uh, individuals from Alberta Environment and Parks. And so they, they tell a little bit of a story of where we're at and uh, there's, there's two key components to uh, watershed sustainability. The first of, that they measure is the snowpack and they measure the snowpack for lots of various reasons. Um, uh, and I know uh, your sister community uh, in Sundry, they measure it on a regular basis for flood mitigation because they want to know what's going to be coming down the pike and how quickly it's going to be coming. So that's one of the reasons that the snowpack is measured. And you can see um, uh, if that's the only thing that uh, supports the flow of the Red Deer River, uh, we're in pretty good shape. Uh, the Old Man, the Bow, the Red Deer, uh, and the North Saskatchewan and Athabasca are all showing uh, normal or above normal flows and and we talked mostly of course about the red deer at our last meeting um, and uh, the snowpack that uh, that serves that uh, red deer river flow uh, is looking really good and so that's an early positive indication uh, about the the water that's coming into the red deer uh, it is of course a snapshot uh, and uh, you can see that the snapshot, how it fits into the average, that gray area is about the average snowpack that they would see. Uh, one of the things that we concern ourselves with is, is when it melts, how quickly it melts, and, and so how quickly that move, water is moving down the river in terms of flow. Uh, so um, th their prediction as of March 1st, of course, we're a little bit later, but as you saw by the graph, um, they don't expect the snowpack actually to peak until uh, late April, early May, so right about this time. So they were really anticipating at the beginning of March that flows were going to be pretty decent uh, coming out of the river. And I think what we've seen with the weather that we've had, the climate we've had so far this spring, that release has been really nice and slow. And I think it's uh, looking to be continuing that way. One of the things that, uh, of course, impacts that is as the weather gets warmer, um, it, 
snow can turn into rain more easily upslope. And uh, if you remember the flooding in, uh, uh, in Calgary not that long ago, there was two contributing factors, all the rain and the altitude at which the rain started to fall that increased this, the melt of the snowpack. So uh, that's a concern that we watch, but so far that looks really good. Um, the other presentation uh, that we received from Alberta Environment was relative to uh, Dixon Dam, and, and this was a learning for me in recent years. Uh, I think as, as boaters and fishers and campers, uh, we think of these things as, as leisure type of opportunities, and that's why they were built, and, and uh, we can enjoy them. Uh, the primary purpose of Dixon Dam and its construction, and of course I should say that um, uh, prior to coming to this region, I spent quite a number of years uh, in, Albert in Lethbridge, uh, Alberta, and uh, of course the sole purpose there is mostly irrigation. There's lots of it down there, so uh, this is a little bit different purpose, and the primary objective of that Dixon Dam is to maintain the downstream flow through the winter months. That's the main purpose. So. Uh, if you go right now uh, to Dixon Dam to go fishing, you're going to be sorely disappointed because it is at its lowest point of the year because the water that was retained in the fall is slowly released throughout the course of the winter to maintain the downstream flows for urban users. So, um, of course, there's lots of secondary benefits once you uh, put a facility like that in place. You have the hydroelectric power generation. Uh, flood mitigation downstream, um, uh, it really improves water quality and, and I don't know uh, a lot about the science of it, although we are involved with it at Cremona as well because uh, if you've got a water treatment plant, uh, you have to deal with things like turbidity in your water. And uh, dams and reservoirs really have a positive impact in decreasing the turbidity and then the downstream users, if, you have, if you've got a more consistent non-fluctuating flow down the river, decreased turbidity, a lot less cost in water treatment, so there's a value in that. Uh, it improved the fisheries habitat, although I can speak from personal experience that I've over, only ever caught one fish in Dixon, so I wouldn't send you there, especially not with me as your guide. <laughs> yeah, you can't catch anything there, I wouldn't go there. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and so uh, for the primary purpose of the, uh, of the Dixon Dam as it is, and I've spent a lot of time on it, um, you can see the significant size of the reservoir and the water that it holds. Um, am I going backwards now? Where am I going? Oh, there we go. Um, it, it, is, it is quite a, a wonder to see, and I grew up about uh, 60 miles uh, north of uh, Diefenbaker Lake. It's, these things are spectacular engineering marvels. Uh, uh, Dixon is one of them. Uh, my understanding is that as a group, uh, Red Deer River uh, users get a once a year tour of Dixon Dam. So I know Councillor Harrison is the Innisfil representative to our group, so uh, he may have been on one of those tours. I'm looking forward to having one this June or July. Um, uh, and, and you can really see the significant difference if you're on there on a regular basis, how they fluctuate and manage the water flow depending on the water that's coming in, the water that they need to hold for um, off-season release. So um, the Dixon Dam, um, when you look at it during the season, here we are in May. Uh, that's why I say there's not much point in going there now is because it's at its lowest level right now and then they'll start to capture it as the snow melt begins in late May, early June, they'll start to capture that water but still maintain the minimum downstream release that they're obligated to maintain. So with that, they fully expect that uh, uh, Dixon will return to its normal levels here, although it started out, a, it, it's starting out the spring a little bit lower than they anticipated. Uh, so um, it's gonna use that above average snowpack to, to refill. And I think uh, that it's no surprise to anyone that we can also use a little bit of rain now to, to help those things along because that's been uh, a little bit of a difficult thing to find. It sounds like uh, maybe we're gonna get some this week. So, um, uh, so if you look at the snowpack equivalent uh, and the normal ranges, um, uh, you see that, uh, as I indicated before, everything that looks like it's coming into Dixon uh, is gonna have a positive uh, impact, even though it's a little bit lower going into this season. So. Um, one of the things that we got out of there uh, from our last presentation is that, um, you know, we've had some alarming situations, but everything looks really good right now uh, with respect to the snowpack. We are looking for rain, but it looks like the reservoirs are going to fill and everything is going to be good for this year. Uh, as I mentioned, the next piece of the story comes at our Red Deer River meeting this Thursday in uh, Drumheller. 
and we've got two presentations on drought uh, and what it looks like and, and how to move forward. And I think that's, our, that's always our immediate concern because I think if we know uh, the climate that we're in, uh, when we have two consecutive years of drought, uh, we're in an interesting situation. It, it only takes two years to put us, to tip our scale and, and have us uh, uh, looking for more water. So that's the, uh, the information that, we, uh, that we've received most recently. Um, I am happy to do my best to answer any questions that council may have, although I indicated I'm not a water expert, but uh, uh, if I do not have the answers for you, I'm absolutely happy to get them to you. And what I will be doing at the end of this week, uh, once we get our presentations put together, is that uh, I will be sending those out as well so that everybody can have a look at those. And, and see what we talked about this week with respect to drought. Uh, we are getting back to uh, in-person meetings, which is always nice, and it's a pleasure to be out here and, and uh, uh, be at an in-person meeting again here as well. So thank you, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Okay, thank you very much, Rudy. That was very interesting. Anyone have questions? Councillor Harrison. Uh, thank you, Mayor Barkley, and through to, to Rudy. Uh, what's What's been the sort of the long-term average uh, on the Red Deer Lake? By that I mean the last 20 years, has it been gradually declining the flows or has it been sort of cyclic up and down? It's been more cyclical than you think and, and I talked about those tributaries that seem a lot lower than, than they have been and I think that we can all generally see that there used to be water standing in places where there's no longer water standing. Uh, but it seems like the snowpack has been well enough that there are some fluctuations, but the Red Deer River has basically flowed. Um, uh, I talked a little bit about our release to Saskatchewan and 50% of that flow of all those rivers, uh, not just the Red Deer, but of all those river rivers, has to uh, remain downstream into the province of Saskatchewan. And I think in the history of that agreement, which goes back to the early formation of our provinces, there's only been two years where we've barely met that demand. So um, I, I think that there are fluctuations, but to date the, the, the river flows have been fairly consistent. We'll get a little bit better picture of that uh, this week. Uh, the gentleman from Alberta Agriculture is, is uh, going to show us some data back to 1888 about how that, the river flows have changed and fluctuated and, and the uses. Um, but, you know, I, I think one of the things that's, that's been happening is that the water has probably been decreasing it, uh, but our ability to put it back after we're done with it has gotten a lot better. Uh, so we're, we're doing more with less. Um, uh, we're, we're learning <laughs> from, from the United States. It's my understanding that uh, the Colorado River, before it reaches the Gulf of uh, Mexico, that every drop of water in that river is used seven times. So uh, that's where we're headed probably. Councillor Heistad. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, question on, I, I remember um, Cross Iron Mills project and I was on council at that time the, and they were wanting to use the Red Deer River, the water uh, itself. But is there any other big projects coming on that you see that we may need to, to advocate for or have some more knowledge on? There's, there's a big project going on at Pigeon Lake that's making the news quite a bit. And I, I think our roles, you know, my, my personal opinion is, is we advocate, you know, we try to use the, the, the watershed as, you, um, as wise as possible. But is there anything that we need to, to be up to speed on? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, I, I think the membership in general of Red Deer River Municipal Users Group would agree with, with you that they want to advocate. Uh, they want the river to be sustainable, but they, we need to grow. Uh, communities are growing. Uh, we want to see the economy grow. We want to see industry grow. So in terms of those projects, um, uh, we haven't seen anything specifically other than the, the fairly major work that's been done on this irrigation project in uh, Municipal District of Acadia along the Saskatchewan border. And um, uh, just as I mentioned it, uh, um, the numbers escape me, but there's fairly significant acreage that they want to irrigate there, and it's gonna, they're doing the work right now to establish whether or not there's water in the watershed to support that demand. I'm not familiar with the, the Pigeon Lake uh, project that you're talking about, uh, so I can't speak to that. I do know that there has been conversations that have started in the last uh, probably three to five years about the need for an additional reservoir on the Red Deer River. 
And that's going to be an interesting conversation because uh, the, the first question is going to be why and the second question is going to be where. So um, uh, there, there was a very specific logic and reasoning to Glenifer, to the Dixon Dam. Um, uh, another downstream reservoir is going to be an interesting conversation. Rudy, can, can you explain to me how the licenses work? Uh, not very well. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and and the, my exposure to the licensing is, is the work that um, the Municipal District of Acadia is going through right now. Uh, and so Alberta Environment will issue a license for water usage, uh, and uh, it's a capped license. And it gives you a little bit of room to say that uh, as a as a red deer community we're going to use x amount of cubic meters of water and that license is a net license so if they're returning water to the river that doesn't work against their license uh, but it allows them to grow and expand etc but one of the things that's become an interesting conversation about licenses so it's just a it's just a basic usage so uh, Municipal District of Acadia, they've not, they've not done their, uh, finished their work yet, but they, let's say that they do this work and they say that we need, um, we need uh, 120,000 cubic meters of water a year to sustain this project. Uh, so that's what we're going to apply for. And so they would build an off-stream reservoir to manage that 120,000 cubic meters a year. But they would first have to answer the question, is there that much water available in the Red Deer River? So the Red Deer River uh, at its maximum is about 660,000 cubic meters a year. We have licensing right now at about 550. We're not using all of that licensing capacity, but that's about where it is. So it's allowing for community growth and that sort of thing. So, so one of the concepts around licensing that's, that's been a, a topic that's come up Previously, among the Red Deer River Municipal Users Group, and now subsequently with this MD of Acadia, is trying to apply for a, a Crown Reservation for water. Uh, that's, a, <laughs> that's like a treasure chest that the government doesn't really want to talk about because we're saying that, um, you know, with industry and expansion, we want to hold X amount of cubic meters of water as a reserve for the existing users. Uh, so um, uh, that's basically how licensing works, is it's just application of water usage against flow and requirements. Uh, uh, and and uh, it's all approved by Alberta Environment. So. And the usages as well. Uh, I, you can appreciate industrial usages for water are going to be under much more scrutiny than municipal uses. So. I guess my, my other question would be around coal and um, potential impacts to our watershed. I, you know, have seen maps where potential coal mining out in the Rocky Mountain House area, Ram River area, and is our DMUG looking at that, addressing that? Is that within the wheelhouse or not? Really? Um, on the radar screen, okay. uh, for sure. Uh, and, and it's just recently gotten on the radar screen because uh, the preliminary conversations around that were more under the southern watersheds. But it's a very important conversation to have. And, and one of the other things that's been uh, a similar part of this conversation is uh, uh, oil companies looking, it takes a lot of water to undertake fracturing. And uh, that's a different conversation than saying that um, uh, we're taking X amount of cubic meters of water out of the Red Deer River. We're using it, we're treating it, returning it. Um, things like mining and fracturing are different conversations because that water isn't readily necessarily returned to the watershed. So it changes the dynamic for sure. Um, but how it does, I'm not familiar with that at all. I know that we were approached in the village of Cremona with respect to fracturing, but they wanted to use our, um, they wanted to use our effluent from our uh, storage lagoons. Uh, makes total sense, but again, um, we release that water on an annual basis into the Little Red, which goes into the Red. And if it's diverted, it doesn't do that. So. Um, I, you know, mining and those types of things uh, have to be under consideration in terms of what the end use of that water is. Yeah, I guess the concern is more around the contamination of the water. I mean, you see a lot of, um, you know, discussion around the Elk River in um, southern Alberta and, and kind of what's happened there and out of tech resources and stuff. Yeah, and, so, and that yeah. wouldn't be anything that certainly that I could speak yeah, to. Yeah, that's so. fine. Yeah. Councillor Bates? Yeah, I uh, 
Thank you for the presentation, and uh, I don't think you should be shy about saying you're getting there as far as being an expert, because I did spend the last four years on MUG, and, and you're grabbing it fast. Um, <laughs> with respect to the mayor's question, I think I think uh, there was one one coal lease that was that was kind of grandfathered, and the rest were all shut down with the last effort. I, but I can't remember. There was one old one that's up in the I don't know, it's somewhere in the Rocky Mountain House area. Um, yeah, uh, you're only uh, from the time I spent on there. You're only whoever's looking at the river because it is the source. The rest of the licenses are all filled up. And so you're only the next person who comes up with some need for water from being uh, looking at, at your advocacy position on behalf of all the municipalities. And there'll be some surprises in the next four years, I guarantee it. You'll just, somebody will come out of the woodwork and say, I need water. And it'll, it'll become a discussion point. So anyway, thank you. Uh, I think it's uh, very educational. Thank you, and, and uh, a point well taken. And we've got a, uh, you know, technologically, we've got a greater ability to move water from one place to another. So, um, you know, there is that vulnerability because we can trench water a long way now or mm -hmm. pump it a long way. So, uh, you're absolutely right with, with this river being the one that has the licenses left uh, from far afield. Uh, they will be potentially looking at the Red Deer for a water source. Councillor Harrison. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Barkley, and again through to Rudy. I, I want to go back to climate change a little bit. <clears throat> uh, I've seen some data coming out of Lake Mead in the States there, and uh, that reservoir is pretty much, it's about half the capacity is what it was 10 years ago, and it, the projections are not good for, for that. The question that I have is, and I'm relatively new to RD Mug. Uh, I took over from Councillor Bates in, in October. Is there any work being done or uh, discussions around climate change modeling as it affects stream flows? Have we, as a group, thought about that? Because climate change isn't, isn't going away, it's actually getting worse. And you know, particularly in Southern Alberta irrigation districts, it, they're supposed to be warming. So the need for water there is gonna be, I feel, gonna be greater. So, and the only place in Alberta where we can go is we sit on the Red Deer River. So, uh, I guess my question is, have we as a RD Mug group thought or discussed about going forth to government with the allowance to talk about some kind of funding for, for climate change modeling as it takes into account the stream flows? Um, yeah, n n not not that specifically, but uh, absolutely those conversations are taking place and we're gathering information and a little bit about what we heard last uh, uh, last meeting about uh, water availability starts to touch on that conversation about uh, the feast or famine that's being created by climate change. You know, we've got flood, drought, flood, drought. Um, so uh, I think it's uh, uh, at this particular meeting when we're gonna start to talk a lot about action plans uh, for the group and, and um, uh, of course I can't speak for the group, but that seems like a logical next step. Um, uh, we, we haven't uh, allocated any funds to any particular research or advocacy over the last couple of COVID years and there's a, a, certainly an appetite among the membership to get back into that arena and uh, this could be very well be a great topic to, to focus in on uh, the next two or three years of, of research that, that we want to support. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much again for being here today. We appreciate the presentation. It was lots of great knowledge in there. Thank you. I hope I was accurate in my information, and if there's anything else you need, by all means, uh, you know where to get, out, get in touch with me, so I'd be happy to provide anything additionally. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so we will move on to 3.2, Councillor Maceros with the Community Awareness Signs and Symbols. Thank you, Mayor Barkley. Uh, <clears throat> I'd just like to take this opportunity to say that I'd like to present a motion at next week's council meeting that council sends a letter of support for Bill <clears throat> C-229 to Peter Julian, NDP, <clears throat> um, 
Member of Parliament for New Westminster Burnaby. Uh, Bill C-229, just to refresh, <clears throat> is an act to amend the criminal code banning symbols of hate. The, the goal is to broaden the provisions relating to hate propaganda <clears throat> by making it an offense to publicly display visual representations that promote or incite hatred or violence against an identifiable group. It's part of a larger anti-racist strategy being discussed in the House of Commons that includes other initiatives such as education, <clears throat> bringing about transparency in algorithms, and <clears throat> increasing messaging around diversity and inclusion. So I'd like to share some of the stats and information with Council and Administration that supports presenting this motion. But first, I'd like to offer condolences for the family friends and community members of the victims of the mass shooting in Buffalo, New York this weekend, and <clears throat> to say that we stand together um, against the hatred of racism and share in your grief. <clears throat> so from the town hall hosted by Peter Julian, uh, these are some of the things that came out of that town hall. Uh, these are unprecedented times in relation to the depth, breadth, and intensity of the hate we're seeing. There's been a 40% increase in toxic hate crimes over the past three years. There is a dramatic growth in the number of organizations. So for example, in 2018, there were 100 groups. In 2021, over 300 groups. Over 80% of hate crimes are perpetrated by far-right extremists. <clears throat> of 221 participants in the town hall, 76% had witnessed or experienced an incident of hate. Um, just think about that number for a minute. Um, <clears throat> hate incidents occur frequently but are underreported for a number of reasons. And groups are diverse in how they represent themselves, but their symbols, language, and uniforms for them are a badge of honor. And the intent is to silence and disrupt the sense of belonging of the groups they are targeting. Media is the most powerful tool of the far right extremists, allowing them to influence the minds of the innocent. Um, there is actually a bona fide Canadian Nazi party in federal politics that has access to voter lists, which means if you donate to this party, you can actually get a tax receipt. <clears throat> um, so banning signs and symbols is a start, but educating our youth and changing the mindset of people has to happen too. And I was hoping that we could have a deeper discussion about what we might do uh, in relation to the public art policy a little bit later in the agenda. Um, from the Understanding Hate and Extremism webinar hosted by the Resilience Project, the Re Resilience Project is a group that works with the public to prevent and counter hate, extremism, and radicalization through research and awareness. In particular, I want to share some information related to the marketing that communities need to be aware of. So first of all, there are several subclassifications of these groups based on the beliefs and mode of operation, um, such as violent involuntary celibates, xenophobic white supremacists, and anti-authority motivated groups, among others. Um, the group I want to talk about are called identitarians. Uh, they're a subclass. Um, they're white supremacists who are focused on sanitizing or softening their message to make it more palatable for a larger swath of people. So for example, their tactics include organizing benign activities such as picking up litter, uh, painting for old folks, um, uh, or they have groups that seem to have environmentally or socially conscious covers. And the group distributes propaganda of themselves doing good work. Uh, one of the ways that they do this is through stickers, and uh, stickers are seen in many communities. Um, and they advertise the good works, and this is one of the ways that they draw, draw gr groups in, and innocent minds. Um, recent events in Canada indicate the ease and speed with which these groups are able to mobilize and get funding. So in summary, um, a comment from an expert in Holocaust studies said, it is more important and impactful to speak out against hate when it is not directed at you or your own group. Therefore, um, based on the support that I've offered today, um, I'll be presenting a motion at next week's council meeting to support Bill 229, uh, and I would be happy to share the U YouTube link of the town hall for anyone who's interested. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Harrison, um, or Councillor Harrison, Councillor Macera, sorry. <laughs> I was looking at Councillor Harrison, <laughs> thinking about him. But uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, did uh, participate that evening in, in the town hall, and um, it was 
really eye-opening. Um, one of the gentlemen that spoke, Bernie Farber, really stood out for me. Um, he's with the Canadian Anti-Hate Network, executive director, and um, stats that he has are, are pretty unnerving. Um, back to Councillor Maceris and the Identitarian, we, we've definitely seen, it um, wasn't too long ago, saw stickers in our, our park, Centennial Park, <coughs> from an organization, and uh, they were also referenced in one of the um, presentations that the Resilient Project did. So it was a kind of environmental message on the sticker, but the group was one of these groups. So, you know, I, I think it's important to, to bring awareness to our community that uh, this is happening everywhere. It's not just happening in other places, it, it's happening here and, and we, we want to be aware of it and we want to report it. I know there was a, an incident not too long ago, uh, a little bit of road rage incident and kind of ra racially motivated and the person afraid to report because if they go to the authorities and the authorities now go to the perpetrator, they're worried about that person coming back at them again. So it just keeps cycling through time and time and time again. So um, fully supportive of, of um, you bringing forward a, a motion uh, to support this. And um, I'm hoping that um, MP Julian can, can get this table and we can get it into, into uh, laws. Because we, we saw we can only do so much here as a municipality. So any other comments or? Councillor Bates? Yeah, I have no, no problem with that uh, and supporting it. Um, I'm pretty sure when Mr. Julian corresponded with us, he gave us a link, and I'm assuming we'll get that link to, the, to what the actual bill is, if we're going to support it. I'd like to reread it, <laughs> or part of it, anyway. The link, uh, sorry, Mayor Barkley, uh, through to Councillor Bates. The link is uh, linked to wording. Uh, it's not linked to the bill, but I can also share that link uh, with Council. Yeah, through to Councillor Maceros. My point is I just want to, if we're going to support the bill as he's presenting it, then I want to be able to read the bill. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, Thanks to Councillor Maceros, uh, who's going to bring this forward next week. Um, that same group that you're talking of had stickers. Um, and, uh, and I think it was last year I sent them, just before the election, and it was ID Canada, and there was stickers going up the, the hill, Centennial Park, and thanks to administration and, and Parks Department for taking those down. They also did the propaganda where... Um, a business in town where they had the letters stating that they cleaned up the community following the Black Lives Matter rally, which was an utter lie, and that's just some of the, the tactics that they use. And um, I appreciate you bringing that forward. I think it's important that our public, you know, our citizens are aware, especially with young kids that are at uh, the skateboard park, uh, these stickers as well. They make them look nice and friendly, like you're a friend and then you have young people or individuals checking into it and it's just it's the hook so thanks for doing that yeah, I think what was interesting when I saw the stickers in the park I went to the website and it wasn't functioning so maybe it's been taken down for now but they they'll rebound rebrand to come back in another in another form Councillor Harrison I uh, thank you Mayor Barkley <clears throat> and through to Councillor Massaros I commend you for for bringing this forth. I know we spoke about two years ago now after our anti-discrimination rally that we had here in, in town that we were going to look at some kind of uh, strategy and what we were gonna do within our community. So I think this is a good step to, uh, <clears throat> I fully support or will support your motion when you bring it forth next week. Uh, I think it's a start and uh, maybe out of that, you know, an action plan down the road. Because I know there was a number of residents that were looking at what are we going to do specific to our community when it came to hate and with symbolism and that kind of thing. And I know uh, it hasn't fallen off the table, but it's just, I think it's been pushed back a little bit, but now maybe it's time to bring it out again so thank you for that Councillor. Yeah, and just so you're aware Councillor Harrison because I, I know you're away but the community standards bylaw came forth so that was one thing area that we asked to 
to try to be included, but uh, the research that administration did, they found out that it really doesn't fall under municipal jurisdiction, it's under federal government, so there's really not much we, we could do in that area of, of um, you know, having infractions and, and all sorts of things, and there was, you know, a, a huge issue with doing anything on private property, but, you know, we, we know there's Confederate flags in this community that are sitting in windows, and, and uh, we, we can't seem to do anything about it, so. Okay, thank you for that update, and I should have read the minutes of the Well, no, it's so, like yeah. it's... But uh, yeah. this morning, going back, uh, I had a, uh, a query from a, a resident. What are we doing about these flags and these symbols that indicate hate? Yeah. And I did say that we were looking for a legal opinion, so we've got that, so... But I think this is a good start if it's at the federal level. Maybe there will be something that comes down from, from the federal level that, you know, that we can work with here. So, again, I commend you and thank you for the update, Mayor Barkley. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's the only place we can go at this yeah. point in time and, and to uh, make it criminal. Councillor Dunham. Thank you, Mayor Barkley. Through to Councillor Mazeros. I commend you, as my other fellow councillors have, for bringing this forward. I... Uh, feel that over the last little while that we see a, a shift in society and this falls to me under the, the guise of freedom of speech. And I think that's where we've kind of fallen off is a lot of people are scared to stand up and to say something because they're gonna be, that idea of freedom of speech is gonna thro be thrown back into their face that I'm allowed to say what I want to say. But if we look at democracy throughout history is it's, you don't impede democracy by putting bylaws and rules in place to stime the, the racism and the hatred and these symbols. So for you to bring this forward, I, I, I commend you for it. And I think we all need to stand up, and as many of us have, to, to share and to put our voices to it because uh, it's becoming so much more prevalent over the last four or five years. And I mean, I think we all can see where a lot of it, ha what the genesis of it has been, um, but it's a worldwide problem, it's not just here. And so I really hope that they're able to do something and I hope that there's a way that there's the public education component of it that the federal government will do, um, because it's without that, it really will mean nothing. It won't be worth the paper that it's written on. So thank you so much. Yeah, just adding counts from a please add, add as well, but with uh, when Bernie Farber spoke, um, he talked about, you know, that the old days before social media, people would have to go stand on the, the corner of the street and hand out their propaganda, so they, they might be lucky if they reach five people, where now in the blink of an eye, you can post something and it can go into various certain social media sites, and within minutes, you have probably put your message out to hundreds of thousands of people. So uh, maybe you have 100,000 people and maybe 20% latch onto that message. So in the blink of an eye, you've now latched onto a new 20,000 people to bring them into to, to this realm. And, and so one of their initiatives is to also try to, um, I guess, I don't know if regulate's the right word, but, but try to find out, you know, the impact from, from social media and some of these websites. And I, I know in the Resilience Project, they gave lots of information and, and named various websites and various groups. And some of those groups are pretty close to home. So that's... Um. That's right. And one of the things that he talked about is uh, getting advisory groups together to work with CRA to disarm funding that promotes hate. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for that. And so we will move forward to 3.3 um, CAO bylaw with Director Vickers. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Barkley. Um, so I do have the draft um, updated Chief Administrative Officer bylaw for your review. Um, the Chief Administrative Officer bylaw sets out the powers, duties, and functions of the Chief Administrative Officer position. <laughs> Administration has conducted a review of the current Chief Administrator Officer Bylaw, and it is attached for your review. This bylaw does combine the 2010 Chief Administrative um, Officer Bylaw 
as well as the 2018 designated officers bylaw, and both of those bylaws will be repealed upon the approval of this bylaw. So some of the sections that were added, we did add um, a definition section um, in this new bylaw that was not part of the old CAO bylaw. Um, we did add, there's just some general provisions um, that just establishes the position that it's gonna be appointed by a resolution of council and that kind of stuff. The next um, heading is administration that outlines that the CAO is the administrative head of the town um, and as well as giving the authority to establish and implement an administrative policies and procedures um, that, that gives the CAO the ability to hire, appoint, suspend, remove, or terminate any employees as well. Um, and as well as establishing the structure of the administration, including creating, eliminating, merging, or dividing departments. The next section is the financial powers and, and functions. Um, so this gives the CAO the authority to um, prepare and submit the annual budget to council, monitor and report to council as required or directed on the operating capital budgets approved by council. Um, the CAO it, uh, may authorize over expenditures within the operating or capital budgets, but at no time may the CAO authorize cumulative operating and capital expenditures in excess. Um, the CAO may pay any amounts the town is legally required to pay pursuant to an order or judgment. Um, the CAO shall designate the financial institutions to be used by the town and shall open and close any banking accounts on behalf of the town. Um, as well giving the CAO authority to invest funds on behalf of the town in, in accordance with the act, this bylaw and any other bylaw as well. So the next section is contracts and agreements and this just gives the CAO um, the authority to enter in agreements on behalf of the town. FOIP head, this does uh, very specifically identify the CAO as um, the FOIP head for the town. Um, for the purpose of the FOIP Act, which is the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. There is some miscellaneous um, powers as well. Um, it also identifies the code of conduct that the CAO holding a position of trust must demonstrate the highest standards of ethics and behavior as a steward of the town. It also ident identifies um, a delegation by CAO section so that the CAO is authorized to delegate and to authorize further delegations of any powers, duties, and functions assigned to the CAO by council um, to any other employee that, that he sees fit. And the CAO has the authority to get, delegate any of the powers, duties, and functions given to the CAO and can authorize the receipts of such delegations to further delegate their powers. So in addition to this section, we are going to be bringing forward um, in the next week or so, a signing authority policy, which will identify the very specific powers that is council, that is the CAO, who signs what, is, is the mayor the first signature, the CAO the second signature, as well as uh, the ability of, for the CAO to delegate some of those powers to other employees as well. So one of the big things is we did um, remove the, the standalone designated officers bylaw and merged it in with this bylaw. In the research that we did do to other municipalities, that is what that is what those other municipalities has done as well. So we only have four designated officers now. We did remove a couple that we did have um, because they'll be taken care of in the signing authority um, policy. So we do have the assessment review review board clerk. Sorry, uh, the bylaw enforcement officer or community peace officer, our municipal assessor, and our subdivision and appeal board clerk. So again, we did remove the Director of Corporate Services and Director of Operational Services as designated officers. And uh, pending on any questions, we would like to bring this back to, um, to Council for formal approval next Tuesday, I guess, on the 24th. Okay, thank you, Director Vickers. Kara, can you scroll back to the financial area and So I guess my, my question is, and maybe it's addressed more in the signing, the check signing policy stuff, and I, I'm not worried about you, CEO Becker, but I look beyond you 
or, <laughs> you know, are there processes, barriers in place that, that would, um, I guess, prohibit one person from maybe being able to close a bank account or does that take two signatures? Like how, how would that work if? Yes, Mayor Barkley, so okay. um, anything to do with a bank, whether it's opening an account, closing an account, even signing checks does take dual signatures. Um, so that will be taken care of in the signing authority um, policy, which means it has to be one of council and one of administration. And it even specifically outlines the positions in administration that can sign checks or deal with the bank. Okay, and then my other question is number 14. I, I don't quite understand it, like may authorize over expenditures within the budget, but at no time authorize cumulative. So Mayor Barkley, for example, if there is one budget line and in that budget line could be a number of items and one could be over budget inside the budget, but okay. not over the entire budget for that line. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Maceros. Thank you, Mayor Barkley through to <coughs> Director Vickers. I was just wondering, what is the line of um, command? Who, is, who would typically be appointed the interim CAO first? Mayor Barkley through to Councillor Maceros. It would be up to CAO Becker in that moment. I think he does have a kind of a schedule that he kind of, go ahead. <laughs> Whoever's been naughty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, sorry, Mayor Barkley. <laughs> it's uh, using it as a growing tool. tool. We used to do it just through the Director of Corporate Services, uh, but I uh, like to use it as a learning opportunity, and all three directors are, are subject to supporting the CAO as acting CAO in my absence as appointed by me. Anything else? No. Then I please have a motion to accept this report as information. Mayor Barclay, I'll make that motion. The council okay. accepts this report as information. Thank you, Councillor Dunham. Any further discussion? All in favor? Perfect. Thank you. We will now move on to 3.4 Public Art with Director Jenkins. Thank you, Mayor Barclay. Uh, so we have an introductory report uh, for council. Uh, looking at potential approaches to establishing a public art policy and program. So on March 14th, uh, 2022, Council directed administration to research and report back to Council uh, on the opportunities for a community art and mural program. Uh, so as a bit of background, what is public art? So public art is not an art form. It can, its size can be huge or small. It can tower 50 feet high or call attention to the paving beneath your feet. Its shape can be abstract or realistic or both, and it may be cast, carved, built, assembled, or painted. It can be site specific or stand in contrast to its surroundings. What distinguishes public art is the unique association of how it is made, where it is, and what it means. Public art can express community values, enhance our environment, transform a landscape, heighten our awareness, or question our assumptions. Uh, placed in, a, in public sites is this art is there for everyone, a form of collective community expression. Uh, so public art is a part of community history, evolving culture and collective memory. The procurement, curation and display of public art is guided by professional expertise and public involvement. Public art is art in any media whose form, function and media, meaning are created for the general public through a public process. Um, so this can mean many things. Uh, this can be art inside of buildings, this can be art um, throughout our community and can be decorative or functional. Um, so what is the value of public art? Uh, so public art has been shown to provide value to communities in numerous ways. Um, every place aspires to be somewhere people want to live and want to visit. Uh, the creation of a community identity, particularly through how a place looks, is becoming increasingly important. Uh, public art creates uniqueness through the capture of the atmosphere and identity of place. Um, public art welcomes artists and creative types into the conversation that shapes our community spaces, adding diversity and innovation. Uh, public art can encourage self-reflection, awareness, and understanding across societal divides. Uh, public art creates opportunities for collaboration through the community. It can be an essential element of when a municipality wishes to progress economically or to be viable to its current and protect prospective citizens. It can transform eyesores into assets, 
and can be a demonstration of community pride. Um, so a lot of those values uh, line up very closely with a lot of conversations that council has had um, about their strategic visions. Um, and there's numerous ways that municipalities can look to develop public art. Um, one of the primary things is to identify goals, principles, and resources. So communities have various, varying levels of resources to establish and support a public art program. Um, the focus of a program can be adjusted as resources and support grow. Um, for example, the city of Mississauga started their art program with a focus on art integrated into public infrastructure. Um, so this would be things like decorative concrete or when you see decorative bridges, those types of things. Um, and temporary works designed to stimulate public dialogue before shifting to larger, more prominent, permanent installations. Um, another way to endorse public art is through available municipal tools, such as the municipal development plan, our area structure plans and outline plans, and design guidelines. Um, another component is to create a plan of an inventory of existing art and then begin to identify potential sites to establish how installations are maintained. A key component is to create a reserve fund to enable the pooling of civic and private contributions along with donations and gifts. A specified percentage of this fund should be allocated to maintenance and conservation. Um, typically a committee or arm's length commission is created to oversee the practices of the public art program in accordance with established municipal policies. Um, we also would want to look at developing educational, education and promotional strategies to raise public awareness and support and ensure that so appropriate resources are allocated to the management and curatorial uh, activities. So um, included a few examples of uh, local art policies and communities uh, in Alberta. So the city of Lacombe has an art development policy um, large component of that policy is that 1% of qualifying capital construction budget is directed toward public art projects. Um, they have an art collection committee who executes uh, acquisitions, deaccessions, conservation, curation, and accepts gifts of art um, and deploys city bu budgets for art development. So the city provides administration and oversight of the committee and the art collection. Um, and the collection consists of both indoor and outdoor installations. Um, Lacombe also has an arts endowment committee, so this allocates uh, interest accrued on a fund to support a vibrant and sustainable artistic community. Uh, the funds support education and opportunities for artists in literary, visual, and performing arts. So it's almost like a scholarship type program, like an artist in residence or something. Um, so the City of Red Deer, their arts policy, uh, similar on the uh, monetary side with a minimum of 1% of their capital cost allocation for any capital project over $250,000. Uh, um, they have a jury committee that selects art to be installed. And the Meet the Street mural program is an initiative of the city's art policy. Um, the Town of Olds has a public art advisory committee that provides recommendations to council in accordance with annual budgets provided. Um, however, there's no standing committee embedded in policy um, or standard commitment embedded in policy that uh, allocates a certain dollar value. Um, City of Calgary, of course, a lot larger scale, but again, they do a 1% of capital projects uh, between 1 million and 50 million to a maximum of $4 million annually to their public arts reserve. Uh, covers the management, administration, maintenance, and promotion of public art. And the Calgary Arts Development uh, operates the program, uh, including community planning, community programming, call for artists, engagement, and procurement of new installations. Um, so in terms of next steps, if council wishes to move ahead uh, with the drafting of a policy, uh, outlining objectives, principles, and governing framework for a program, um, that would be your choice. Uh, the creation of a policy should include uh, a sustained funding source. For example, if um, we were to allocate 1% of annual capital projects over $100,000, uh, this would have equated to approximately $63,400 in 2022. Um, as there's currently no internal capacity to uh, administer the program, um, we would likely be looking to utilize a volunteer committee, potentially the Community Services Standing Committee, uh, with administrative support from staff. So 
um, at this point, yeah, looking for discussion and direction on public art. Thank you, Director Jenkins. Discussion. <coughs> Councillor Hyde Dunham. Mayor Barkley, through the um, Director Jenkins. Thank you. The scope of this, I mean, it's so granular and more than I could have ever expected for you to come back with. So thank you very much on that. Um, I think everybody here sort of knows my stance on public art and part of my platform when I was running was the beautification and, and trying to bring a, a sense of community um, back or not back to, but expand that within within Innisfail. And I mean, uh, myself and Councillor Heistead have been working on a mural project here for the last several months and have um, been in conversations with different arts groups within town. And I definitely am happy to see this, how it goes forward, so as, because as you mentioned, the capacity with administration to oversee it is really non-existent. So whether it ends up in the community standing or, or whatever, um, I guess that's something that needs to be ironed out, but uh, I, I like the direction it's going. Um, as far as where the funds come from, that's, that's a whole, uh, <laughs> that's a very difficult conversation, you know, with, within the community, what, what, what will their feelings be to see where we're directing money? I mean, I like the idea of reaching out to the community for gifts, um, that sort of thing, but uh, that's, that's a touchy subject and one that we're obviously going to have to discuss further and, and, and really find out what the public appetite for that is. Um, beyond that, Yes, just thank you very much for, for bringing this back to us. Thank you, Councillor Dunham. Councillor Heistad? Yeah, um, uh, Director Jenkins, uh, thanks for the work that you put into this. Uh, uh, Councillor Dunham had, had summed it up really well. Uh, there's just huge potential. Uh, I was in Lacombe this past week, Red Deer. Uh, I was downtown bugging these uh, some of my friends. Uh, Dale, I was messaging him with murals and stuff downtown Red Deer, and I think this um, there's an opportunity um, to to have a real cool synergy with different groups in town that may want to contribute. Um, and there's many ways that uh, people or individuals may want to contribute or businesses. I think there's opportunities for legacy as well. You know, we have our uh, bench program uh, with our parks, but maybe there's individuals that may want to, you know give back to the community through community art or murals um, being creative and and uh, i hope that it doesn't take up too much time for administration but I, i'm certain that there's people in this community that want to help out so thanks to you and your your colleagues thanks thank you mayor barkley through to director jenkins uh yeah thank you so much for putting that together it was so informative um i'm wondering what does um, a draft policy exactly entail? And at what point would um, there be discussion about, for instance, how do we express our community values? How do we heighten awareness? What issues do we want to heighten awareness? What areas? Um, our community identity and the goals, principles, and uh, resources. So I guess in, in my mind, that would be a conversation for if we determine there's a committee or if we call for a group to come together to help to um, put together that vision, but we would likely want to draft a policy that would at least highlight um, sort of the structure of it, whether it's how, who's going to oversee it, that there is um, some sort of funding mechanism, or is it just something that council determines year by year, or is it something that's embedded into our, our processes that it gets um, allocated? Um, but yeah, to, to allow for that, um, that conversation and the vision to be set up so that um, objectives can be met if, if it is a, a mural focus early on or is it, um, you know, we're going to be building a recreation facility. There's going to need to be uh, consideration for art within that facility, uh, different things like that. Even within our design guidelines um, for new subdivisions, things like that, is it 
is it decorative concrete? Is it you know different things like that that um, that can all come together to create the the feeling that we're hoping to achieve? Thank you. It's very exciting. Councillor Bates. Um, yeah, something new to us, and it, it looks to me like it'd be very interesting. Um, a couple of watch out for us in my mind would be a concern of taking on maintenance of something that might be endowed to us if it wasn't constructed properly in the first place. We definitely would want to have uh, some input on that or, or even the option to not take the maintenance on if, you know, if you look at the mural that was painted over, the paint's now all coming off on that building, so whatever they put on there was so inferior that the mural's gonna come back. Uh, <laughs> which, um, yeah, it won't come back the way we'd like it. Um, and I think, depending on the funding, I, I, I think Councillor Dunham touched on that that needs some work and, and some um, sensitivity. Uh, obviously a lot of our capital is granted to and the 63,000 that you mentioned it would have worked out to this year mm -hmm. is is basically close to 1% taxes actually but very mm -hmm. close um, and I think as we put money towards public art, art we should have the option to reserve it and not just spend it because it feels like it needs to be spent because I know I think that's led to some problems in Calgary. Um, the blue ring comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> and some indigenous structural steel that didn't get uh, done according to how the indigenous folks felt it should be. And I think the one statement you had buried in there was for the public through public process. Mm -hmm. That needs to really be worked on. Uh, that needs to drive it, thank you. Yeah, and like everybody else, thank you, Director Jenkins, for putting all this together. It was very informative. Um, uh, the, the one statement that really stands out for me is that this is to, you know, welcomes artists and creative types to the conversation. So in my opinion, if we're going to do that, we need to have a committee that's specific to this. Mm -hmm. I would also like to see youth on that committee. And, you know, we, we talk about sustainability. So, you know, building that capacity in the community and ensuring that this survives one, two, three, four, however many councils, that things don't reverse down the road. Uh, you know, how, how do we set it up, as Councillor Bates said, with, with the maintenance of, of mm -hmm. murals or other art installations? Um, I, I believe our, one of our policies, so for things that maybe service clubs do mm -hmm. and install things like Centennial Park, you know, the, I think the onus is now, has been put back on those service clubs to maintain those and when, when you're a service club and you already have put in a hundred thousand dollars it's very difficult for a service club 10 years later or 15 years later to say oh gee now we need to start this all over again and i think the mindset has always been that money gets invested by the community the volunteers in the community and then the town takes on the maintenance so you know th th this seems to be going to be set up a little bit different, but I, I think when we're thinking about that, it, it kind of puts my mind down to Centennial Park and, mm -hmm. and how that's some of the installations down there are looking right now and, and you know, who and how can, can uh, maintain that. So um, I, I love this idea and I, you know, love the fact of gifting, but, you know, I, I know you're busy and administration, your, your, your teams are busy, but I, I really believe that that you know they're, they're such talented people in this community and, and they would likely want to be involved in, in this and and like I said it, it's building capacity in the community right it's it's not kind of lumping everything into to one committee it's it's um, kind of driving other interests in the community and, and this would be something really new for people to get involved in mm -hmm. and I think it'd be great for kids to get involved in it too so great um, and that's definitely something that was highlighted going through the research is that um, that whatever an allocation that goes toward it, that there is a component that goes towards 
sort of that maintaining or when things reach their end of life that, that they come out. Um, you know, you use the example of Centennial Park, but the murals are, are another example where sort of in the absence of this larger program and, and set up that someone has a great idea for the Centennial or whatever, it, they get put up and the, you know, the agreements, the, the expectations aren't all flushed out at that time. So then when things get painted over or buildings get built in front of them, those types of things, um, there's, there's varying opinions throughout the community as to whether those things should have happened or not. Well, and, and the reality is, you know, when you have a mural on a private building, mm -hmm. you know, how does the municipality protect that mural? Is it even possible? There, yeah. there are ways through through okay. agreements with okay. those those property owners. Um, you know, of course, they can't extend forever. Or in the mm -hmm. the situation where the other building gets built in front of it, right? Mm -hmm. That's not between the the property owner and who put the mural up. That's, That's right. the adjacent property owner. Um, but and again, I guess creating that that value in the community where no one wants to see the mural go away, right? So there is that um, that added a level of support. And if the municipality has money set aside for, you know, when something gets damaged or they can, uh, can work through that. So. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a great idea to have maintenance funds there. Uh, however, that gets funded from, you know, be like even half a point is you know, $35,000. So the yeah. 1% seems fairly high, but um, maybe steps. half of that mm -hmm. potentially. I, I don't know how much it costs to do a mural and maintain a mural, so mm -hmm. I guess that information would be very valuable too. And mm -hmm. Anything else? I would have somebody please make a motion to accept this as information. I'd like to make that motion, Mayor Barkley. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Or, geez, <laughs> it's, it's twice now. Do you want to change your name? I used to, yeah, I, I, I used to get called Berkeley all the time, so there you go. <laughs> anyway, uh, all in favor? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we'll move on to 3.5, the utilities bylaw with Director Kennedy. Thanks, Mayor Berkeley. Uh, not so exciting topic, so. Um, yeah, so just here to review the proposed amendments to the existing utilities bylaw, uh, as well as provide just a quick update to Council on the previous uh, amendments that we did in 2020. Um, these kind of will flush out a little bit of the topic in regards to our uh, meter rates and how those were established. So in 2020, we did review and amend the bylaw in four areas. Um, I've attached the, the report that we provided to council back then. Um, so the four items included a flat rate charge for multi-use or multi-unit dwellings uh, we reviewed nine municipalities and provided a comparison of rates and fees. At the time um, of the review, we did come back with um, the calculations to show that we are providing fair and equal um, charges in regards to multi-unit dwellings. Uh, second, we provide clarification in regards to irrigation meters and needing a, a dedicated water service line. Uh, we provided a revised water meter charge in regards to our water meters. Um, this was to provide um, a replacement values for those meters. And we added the uh, stormwater service charge um, that year as well. This year we are looking at, at various areas. Um, the first of amendment <clears throat> was to add all owners for the property in section 3.1. And this is just only just for a clarification. Second, we added uh, additional use alternative for or additional use of alternative waste, wastewater service in sections 4.29 and 4.2 4.31 this was to provide clarification on uh, when private wastewater facilities are permitted and when they uh, when they are not allowed then we provided uh, additional clarification in regards to foundation drain sump pumps and garage sump pumps um, this has been uh, an area where we've been getting some clarification and just some information from residents to, uh, to clarify how and, and when those are allowed. Um, fourth is additional enforcement in sections 8.2. This is to allow for fines on violations that may be missed as outlined in other sections. Number five, we provided additional enforcement sections um, 
These were added to provide alternative options for enforcement measures on a case-by-case -case basis to prevent uh, limitations to the officers. Under definitions, we added or amended um, development or developed properties definition, uh, meaning residential parcels of land that has fully or substantially developed for a significant period of time, but has not been previously fully serviced with water and wastewater. Municipal ticket shall mean a form prescribed by the chief administrative officer of the town or their designate, allowing payment to the town office for the penalty specified uh, by this bylaw of an offense. Uh, outstanding payment, um, account payment we extended from 30 days to now 45 days. And then violation tickets, uh, just a definition in regards to the Offense Procedure Act. And then in Schedule D, we did add a, a more specific fine uh, chart to provide clarity and ease for enforcement. Uh, most bylaws and acts have these schedules to be transparent on what the fines are. So um, if there's any more specific questions we could go through, if you like. Otherwise, this is just uh, for review and we'll bring back for adoption. Thank you, Director Kennedy. Any questions? <coughs> Councilor Heistad. Uh, this is fun stuff. No, uh, actually, I, I think it's, it's you know, for, for myself, just jumping back into this stuff for, uh, I'll review it, but I, I know I've had some questions about mm -hmm. some of this, uh, the utility rates and, or, yeah, utility bylaw in the past. So, um, no, I appreciate you bringing it forward. It allows us enough time. And I just thought I'd say you're, you get the fun stuff. Yeah. So, thanks. thanks. So, C Councillor Heistad, can I ask you, because you, like, brought this up to be reviewed, are there specific questions around yeah I, I I didn't want to debate it like I, I, I want to review it you know once again but I, I think the biggest the one question that did come up to me was uh, one of the facilities where they had one meter and then I think each unit had uh, it was one Flat big rate. big meter and then all the other units it wasn't separate or it wasn't separate right I think that was the concern and um, you know I, I, I think educating ourselves on the bylaw and how the functioning of it works. And I think each building may vary uh, because of the time it's built. Um, it's helpful for us to understand the bylaw. And uh, so I, that's, that's what I wanted to present. I didn't want to get into the semantics of right. that certain situation, but that's what brought it to, to me. Uh, Councillor, I said so. That that is the attachment that was yeah. added to this. So it is a breakdown as as to how we reviewed those uh, and provided the clarification as to um, what the difference would be if we were to pull it out. So that provides you that background yeah. in that amendment. Yeah, and it, it came up last term, and I, I think the issue was around multi-unit buildings, mm -hmm. and there was some resistance to having each unit being charged flat rate on on the bills. But you know we. I mean, I, I guess you can structure this any way we want. The, the fact is we, we need to bring in money <laughs> to cover water and wastewater costs, however that might look. But, um, you know, I, and there, there's just, I think, one, one main going into the building, right, Director Kennedy? And then, you know, and the argument was, well, you know, you only have one pipe coming in. Why are we being charged all these doors? But every user in that building, every time they turn the tap on, they're they're a user of the system that starts at the Red Deer River, right? It's not just that pipe coming into your building, it's the whole system. So that's kind of where we settled. Um, you know, I, I think our rates are very reasonable. I, I was reviewing them this morning. Um, like Olds is 1280 flat rate on water, 1840 on wastewater. Uh, Sylvan is 3867 flat rate on water, 2482 on wastewater. Uh, Penhold 1730 and 2430 fixed rates, so it varies, and I think we left ours at 10 on the wastewater, and and our, our cubic meter charge is 631 in and out, and a cubic meter, and I, I often say this to people, like, do you know how much a cubic meter is? No, well, it's 200, almost 220 gallons of water, so they're getting, we're getting that in and out of our house for six dollars and thirty cents, so, uh, you know, it, it's not overly 
expensive. And it's a matter, do you want to raise flat rates so that more people are sharing in the cost of that usage, or would you rather have it where the people that are using the water are the ones that are probably paying more than the ones that are not using the water? That's kind of the, the conversation we had last time, just so, so you're aware. Uh, thank you, Mayor Barclay. A question through to Director Kennedy. On the dedicated water service lines for irrigation meters, yep. what's been the, the request on that? Have we had an, a number of requests for specific water lines for irrigation? Uh, so, Councillor Harrison, so uh, when we did do the review, we did have a number of requests back in 2020. Um, so we did uh, add that into it just for clarification more than anything. Um, the concern obviously before was that we would, uh, the requests were to, to try and put a meter onto the line on a single line coming off the, the property. The concern with that obviously is not having it done properly. Um, that meter obviously is on one line, so it becomes very difficult. So, so we did add that clarification in regards to irrigation specifically. But we haven't had any sort of uptake on actually putting the, the meter on, right? Yeah, no, okay. we haven't had enough. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bates. So talking to two of those, uh, first with the, the meter on a multiple, um, the logic that, that I picked up from administration at that time was some folks feel that the flat charge is just for the meter. And if there's only one meter, you should only have one flat charge. And, and the way it was kind of explained that I adopted was it's, it's the flat charge per family, if you will, that yeah, you've got one meter, but you've got all these families living in some of the uh, residences and you might have a single person living in a house. And uh, so you can make the argument the other way that the, the flat charge is unfair to the person who, who just, yeah, using minimal water. So that was the logic that made sense to me was that, that per family it's, uh, it's equal. Um, and on the irrigation one, I actually had a couple of people approach me and uh, I kind of made an argument back to our council at the time um, that we not, what we've written in is that if you want to have an irrigation line that you don't have to pay sewage on, um, you have to actually go right out to the street and hook on to the water main again and have the, uh, I'm not sure what that valve's called in your lawn, but uh, there is a name for it. Yep. Um, and it's, it, it still doesn't seem to make sense to me that if, that you couldn't, you're buying the meter from the town anyway and, and they have to know you have it. I still don't understand why you couldn't have it teed off at your house, inspected annually. Um, yeah, that, that I, I still have a little difficulty with that. What I, what I just said though would open the potential for a few of our residents who have considerable funds maybe to invest in that so they don't have to uh, pay sewage on their irrigation water. So you'd, you'd lose a little bit of the sewage charge, but you'd have a greener town. <laughs> so anyway, the, those are two comments. Thank you. And my understanding too, Councillor Bates, like the flat fee is really a lot to do with infrastructure sustainability as well. And I, I also think we just had a presentation from RD Mug. So, you know, watering lawns is nice, but um, we also need to be concerned about water conservation. And, and I, I see in the bylaw the, um, between in the summertime, the um, watering of on odd and even days and certain times a day. So I'm sure that goes out in the utility bills, but some of us, do online and we don't necessarily open the, uh, <laughs> the extra part, but I, I don't know if you're going to do lots of um, you know, messaging around that as well, because I, I imagine there's people that aren't, aren't even aware of it, but it really is, you know, it's important to, to conserve water and... Yeah, yeah we, we're not overly strong on the enforcement of, of the odds and evens, but we do provide messaging out every spring 
uh, just to try and remind everybody of that. And then where it really comes in handy is when we do have a very, very dry year and if we need to conserve water for our reservoirs, then we will then start throwing that out there as more of a, of a, of a tool. Great, thank you. So if there's nothing further, we'll have somebody please make the recommended motion. Councillor Highstaff. Yeah, uh, recommended motion that council accepts the report as information and the administration brings back the amendments to the utilities bylaw for adoption. Great, thank you. All in favor? Thank you. And next we have 3.6, a little bit more exciting for Director Kennedy, disc golf. Thanks. <laughs> This one is a little more exciting. So um, as you, you may have heard, so on the weekend they were out doing some updates to the, the nine hole golf course, uh, disc golf course that was, that was built last year um, to provide the new signage on the holes. Um, overall, the attendance through the first year uh, from what we've heard has been very good. Uh, based on the app, uh, the UDisc Disc Golf app, uh, I wasn't able to get the actual numbers, but um, I've heard they're they're very significant, um, as well as many uh, positive feedbacks in the app. So I did download the app and was able to read some of those feedbacks. So um, some of the things that they've they've put on there is that it's a very challenging course, very fun course to to play. So so that's a positive uh, for the town getting out there. Uh, this past weekend, yeah, they did finalize the signage or it got started on it. As well, it's made some, made some minor adjustments to their basket installations. They had some issues with it uh, heaving over the winter, so they are looking at, at fixing those issues as well. Um, the club have, uh, has asked that um, we have a discussion in regards to the possibility of expanding the course and including the back nine. So I believe we had some... There we go. So that's the front nine there, as it is. If you scroll to the next one. So there's the 18 holes. Um, as you can see, they are proposing for three holes to the south of the existing course, south of the dog park, and then it does go across the trail to the west, uh, where they're proposing the additional six holes. Um, what they have asked, or if, if council is interested in having a look at this, um, we are asking that, um, or the club has asked that they ribbon off the, the sections, very similar to what they did on the front nine. Um, so we could go out, have a look, and see what this look looks like. Um, with the clear understanding to the club that no clearing or uh, disturbance to the park itself is to happen at this time. So. Um, yeah, just want to open it up to council for discussion and see what your appetite is for the back nine. Okay, thank you, Director Kennedy. Any comments? Uh, I'm open up. I'm open to that. Like if they tag it and take a check, yep. check it out. I think that's our due diligence in our role. Uh, I think this is kind of exciting. It gets people to do something different, and hopefully, you can bring people into town as well to. Uh, Enjoy the area. Councillor Harrison. Uh, thank you, Mayor Barkley. Uh, I would like to see it uh, pre-ribboned so that we can go out and actually walk it, Director Kennedy. And uh, you'd mentioned no clearing at this time. I look at these three holes that are south of um, the dog park in the trees there, and that's pretty heavy bush. and. Will we have an idea of how much clearing may take place if that is approved? Yeah, uh, Councillor Harrison, so what they typically try to do, this is rough, um, they try and pick existing trails. Okay. Uh, and that's what they will you know, adjust this to. They've tried to pick some existing trails to walk through, okay. and that's how they all go. Uh, they don't want to clear. They, they tried to keep the, the clearing to a minimum last time, um, even though they did make do some but they do try and focus that on, on low disturbance. Okay, thank you. That's why it's very important to me that we actually see where the ribbons are gonna go. So thank you. Councillor Maceros. <laughs> thank you, Mayor Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I like the idea of expanding it. Um, my question or concern is about the three, three or two holes that kind of cross the um, path that 
the walking path um, closer to Napoleon Park. Um, so I I'm not that crazy about those holes going there. Um, and then the other thing I just kind of wanted to mention, when we did our green and clean last week and we were up in this area and there were, there was a lot of um, leftover cement that hadn't been kind of picked up. So I would want to make sure that, you know, that there's some, something in place to ensure that that gets picked up um, if these additional holes go in. Thanks. Councillor Dunham. Uh, thank you, Mayor Berkeley. Through Director Kennedy. I, I as well would love to go for a tour when it's ribboned off and I actually look forward to trying to play it this summer. I think it's a great asset to the community and uh, I also, as I said, mentioned, you know, if it brings people to town and we get some tourism dollars out of it and a little bit more exposure out of it, I think that's brilliant. Councillor Bates? Yeah, I would be receptive to them ribboning it off and walking it, and I I did walk every hole of the original nine, and uh, you got to be part mountain goat to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> to walk some of that, uh, particularly the last three three holes, four holes. So, uh, yeah, I would be receptive to seeing seeing what they have to present to us. Thanks. And I would echo the comment of Councillor Maceros, not, not Harrison, that <laughs> that uh, there was some spilled concrete, like they probably used a bobcat bucket. There's, there's quite a bit of spillage there that should be picked up. Thank you. Yeah, and I too would like to walk the, the new nine. Um, a little bit of a concern on the right hand side of the path is going up the, the hill there and in that bushy area and I also have a bit of a concern just because it's difficult to tell distance and stuff but on the, the left hand side the hole that kind of curves around the, the edge of the lake and I always think um, like don't think of this as just maybe four people playing this but we, we have heard potential opportunities of 800 people coming to a, a tournament so um, you know me the tree police but I, I was actually out on on Saturday and I, I walk the the course the the first nine um, there's probably some brush and stuff to clean up in in there there's um, a few trees down and and uh, at the east end director Kennedy um, it's very wet of course the snow dump right it goes there in the winter time and I'm wondering if there's potential and don't have to worry about it right now because we're not anywhere near winter but you know the amount of snow that goes into that snow dump I, I think of environmental potential environmental issues with what's in that snow and it running down the hill and eventually getting into Napoleon Lake um, I was like between the, the dog park and, and that hole that runs parallel to the east fence and it was it was wet in there like it's still so wet that you know you're sinking into it and and I, I talked to the, the guys that were out working on the course and they were even asking if, you know, potentially the snow dump could be moved either a little bit further east or I, I guess I would ask if maybe even an, another location. I don't know if that's possible, but, um, you know, it, like even down through the bush where the new holes are going, like that is so wet in there. And I think it's like even this time of year because of the, the snow melt coming down. And of course it gets into the northeast end of the or southeast end of the dog park too it's pretty ugly up up there at this time of year so those are just my some of my thoughts yep thanks for Barkley um yeah those are definitely areas that we brought up when we did the initial nine it was in re regards to I think that's hole number five uh being in the location that it is it's always it's a yearly it's wet yearly and I believe last year what they did is they did put a temporary basket in in order to avoid where it was because it was so wet so um, they're they're aware of the situation that it was because we made it very clear at the time um, the snow dump uh, it is in a strategic location because of um, we're, we're limited on where we can pile our snow and and if we remove that that means ultimately going back to the town yard so it just increases our operating costs for for snow removal um, but yeah as we kind of go through this and, and learn as the course gets developed, we'll continue to monitor. Sure, that yep, sounds good. So I, I guess the next steps would be that um, they get it, somebody gets it ribboned off and then we can pick a time to, to go view it. Mayor Berkeley and uh, uh, Director Kennedy, I know it's been tagged by council to review parking too for the dog park and 
uh, is likely that would generate for the conversation on the snow dump. Um, we know how important those dumps are. Dumps are their port amenity um, with with the cost, but it's probably leading into more robust uh, understanding of what the snow dump, what that facility looks like, and where do we dump, and potentially even costs. Uh, perhaps even a service review. But I'm, I'm not telling council what to do, but that's what I'm kind of picking up through conversation that uh, uh, prepares prepare ourselves for future direction on snow dump uh, service review. Um, so yeah, so just kind of lodge that into your, our minds administratively as we Next week. talk about parking. It's like a kitchen renovation, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, even down the, the south side of the, the dog park, that trail that goes down, like it's so wet, even even now, it's it's extremely wet. And uh, as you know, I don't, I don't need to tell you, but but yeah, we, we won't do that today. <laughs> so are there any more discussions? If not, I'll have somebody please make a motion to accept this as information. I'll make that motion, Mayor Berkeley, okay. uh, to accept information and bring back the final details for the course back nine. All right, perfect. All in favor? Great, thank you. <laughs> we'll move into 4.1, correspondence and information. to accept the correspondence? Sure. I'll just... make that motion. Okay, thank you. Anybody have anything they want to discuss in the correspondence? No? Okay, all in favor of the motion? Thank you. And we'll now go to round table, starting with Councillor Dunham. <coughs> thank you, Mayor Barkley. Um, last week was fairly slow for me, at least with council stuff. Um, I was able to attend the Thursday uh, meeting here in chambers with Sean and Rory and Andreas. Uh, I thought it was an exceptional presentation. Um, some of my concerns um, were addressed. I was worried about the size of land that they would require and the building envelope, that sort of thing. But uh, I think that the project um, has great potential for, for the area. Um, I learned a lot and it was really interesting to hear all the different components that become apart from a waste to energy um, facility like that. Um, got a lot of things on the agenda this coming week, but uh, yeah, looking forward to them. Thank you. Councillor Bates. So um, since last council meeting, I attended the Mountain View, Mountain View Regional Water Commission monthly meeting. Um, and you'll notice I finally got the minutes into the <laughs> into the correspondence. I've been a little bit negligent there. Um, and the commission is working on a, a new business plan, which will probably cover the next four, four or five years and even beyond, and that will be public once it's adopted. Uh, I attended the Sean Collins uh, Waste Energy presentation uh, the seniors' lunch and Q and A. I found that very interesting, actually. Um, I, I caught myself. I got caught a little bit off guard when the mayor credited me with the uh, rail pedestrian crossing, and I didn't have a hot mic to to respond. <laughs> but uh, I may have pushed a little bit. But that was totally a team effort of last council and admin, and staff really did all the work with CP. Um, so I want to make that acknowledgement. Uh, after that, uh, to, off to the Green and Clean at Centennial Park. I did go to the ITT presentation. <laughs> Still laughing about that at times. And on Saturday, I had the opportunity to uh, enlighten myself with the uh, depth of the admirable family business, the Golden Mini Donuts. Um, this week, I have MPC and the Alberta Municipalities Fiscal Framework. Docks Rock and the Red Deer College. Thank you. I'll retrieve my bouquet to you. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Heistad. 
Yeah, um, I attended ACCPA. Uh, there was one day there. Uh, it, I've got age friendly, RDC. Uh, in my calendar is also Alberta Muni's. Seems like it's it's a busy last couple of weeks. Um, I said age friendly. Sean Collins, uh, policing committee, and uh, the seniors. I love the seniors event. That was awesome. I wish we could do that every three months because it was fun. So it was. I thought it was really good. And then, um, yeah, I I think the big thing for me was. Um, uh, what I was going to ask Director uh, Kennedy, Kennedy, I'm picking on you. No, actually, um, the question about cutting, and I, I noticed this about week week ago, like we when we whack trees in town, it's it's nice to have a, a heads up, kind of just saying, hey, we're going to whack some trees, just so that we know if citizens are upset, we have a, an answer, and, and there were some trees by the uh, White Rock there, and it actually looks nice and clean. I think those trees were ready to go, but it, it, I think it's helpful uh, for us. Um, and I uh, appreciate all the work that you do. So not trying to be too hard on you. Thanks. Should have been here last year when they came down on 51st yeah. Avenue. I, yeah, I, I don't know how you guys handled that because that was a... Phone, but phone CAO Becker. Those, those trees look really... They're coming. And even on the other side, they're coming up. So... It's people get passionate about trees. Councillor Harrison. Uh, thank you, Mayor Barkley, and I would agree. People are passionate about trees. Did it for 40 years. Uh, I just returned from holidays last week. It was a week today, and uh, so I don't have much to report prior to that, other than if you want to see my pictures of <laughs> the green landscape in Ireland. But uh, I did last week uh, attend the Green to Clean in Centennial Park. The seniors luncheon and the Yek Dev uh, presentation from Sean Collins and we'll be attending the FCSS annual meeting in Black Falls tomorrow morning uh, going up with Karen and and her crew and I'd just like to go back to trees a bit and and I would agree with Councillor Highstead that the trees people do have a passion for trees and 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 I think I'd brought it up previous council about a tree management plan. We have areas in town that, um, Director Kennedy, that the species aren't conducive to longevity, and those being black poplar and aspen. 60 years and they tend to get, get rotten. And I think that's what happened to the trees on 52nd, 52nd Street. And I guess my, my question would be, do we or should we look at a tree management plan on some of our plantings throughout uh, throughout the town so that we might be able to go to the public councillor high said with a, with an idea of maybe three years or five years down the road that we're gonna whack those trees <laughs> i'd like to use different terminology but but it's remove those trees anyways Pardon? yes yeah replace yeah um, so thank you it's, it's just i guess a quick response since councillor harris so we did last year um, do a full inventory of all of our trees. Um, we are working on a five-year um, tree plan. Unfortunately, our, our lead horticulturist went on some leave, so we are we'll just trying to fill that void, but we are planning. That is definitely a plan for us to get that out to everybody so that it's a lot easier to show where we're going to be and, and how we're going to replace. Councillor Maceros. Thank you, Mayor Barkley. Uh, I had an opportunity to serve as an alternate on the transportation committee last week, and I enjoyed that. Um, I at also attended the presentation by Sean Collins and co. Um, <coughs> did the green and clean with my colleagues, and that was fun. Seniors lunch, and I liked the way uh, Councillor Bates talked about the food trucks, um, the depth of the admirable family business. That was great to see what she, what she um, manages. This week, I've got the Municipal Planning Commission, um, Policing and Safe Committees, uh, the Chandos Group on Wednesday, and uh, Red Deer Polytechnic on Thursday. So a, a good busy week ahead. Thank you, Councillor Macero. So last week attended Sean Collins' presentation, the senior drop-in Q&A, uh, went to the hospital auxiliary, auxiliary tea that afternoon, um, just so 
people are aware, they're uh, fundraising for the doors at the hospital because the ambulance is now too wide to fit in the ambulance bay. So patients are being unloaded in the parking lot. And um, the ladies, I, I guess, I think they've taken the ladies off, but the hospital auxiliary is, is raising funds currently for that project and I'm um, kind of awaiting some more information because I'm not sure if that's a shared cost with the owner of the building or whether that's all on the hospital auxiliary to, to have to fund that. Uh, they went to the green and clean challenge and on Friday I had a meeting with Mayor Ken Johnson and Mayor Mike Yarjo on Surround the Red Deer Hospital and some of the urgency around that facility. Um, you know, we're seeing some stories of ambulances lined up. Of course, there was an announcement for a 10-year plan. Um, Mayor Johnson has been trying very hard to get some information about that plan and, and even the previous funding that was announced. So uh, we're, we're taking this to the South, or to the Central Alberta Mayor's Group meeting this week to uh, have some discussions around this and, and how we can proceed and, and support um, the users and, and the workers at, at that hospital and, and try to help them move things forward so things get better. Uh, but certainly it's having some impact in our community. You reached out to Dr. Christensen and, and yes, uh, people are been, being diverted to other communities for tests and whatnot and as well as um, being backed up with, with surgeries. I was on a, a meeting with Public Safety Canada. It was around the RCMP and uh, the retroactive pay, so Director Victor, so they still haven't quite decided where they're, they're going with this yet. I, I think the previous correspondence we had, it mentioned there wouldn't be any payment this year. I would say my takeaway from that meeting was there could be payment this year. Um, still working uh, with the, the federal government to determine who is going to pay and how much. Uh, there was some discussion around from municipalities that you know people were under the understanding there could be a two and a half percent increase which was fine but it turned out to be like a 10 or 11 which is not okay so I, I think you can look forward to getting something maybe the fall I, I don't know who knows but um, and then of course the food truck on Saturday which was lots of fun to to see Ra Ramona's operation and, and the extent of it and and how busy they are it's it's quite mind-boggling this week, uh, tomorrow, we'll have the mayor's South Central group, um, Alberta municipalities, local government fiscal framework meeting, victim services, um, been invited to the AGM, our possible futures, was, which is the Shanto's presentation on Wednesday morning, uh, the Innisfail Medical Clinic docks rocks on Thursday, um, Red Deer Polytechnic tour, uh, the mayor's Central Alberta group uh, later in the week, and then uh, there's EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility Webinar on Friday. So, and I will go on to upcoming events now, 6.1. Mm -hmm. I was saved by Tara Downs at the library today because um, Heidi Nelson, who's doing the Docs Rocks, her art class, uh, she messaged me this morning, they needed rocks. I'm going, oh. <laughs> so, so I thought, well, here I go down to the river. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, they, they had some out of the library from previous engagements, so I picked those up and we'll deliver them to Heidi this evening. So appreciate them being involved very much. I'll just have somebody make a motion, please, to accept the inf this as information. I'll make that motion, Mayor, Bar Mayor Barkley. I almost <laughs> said it. <laughs> Close. All in favor? Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. And we'll have a motion, please, to go in camera. Mayor Barkley, I'll make that motion. Perfect. Thank you, Do Councillor Dunham. All in favor? Thank you. Recording stopped.